everybody. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Hunter. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Veritas Forum. Thank you all for coming. Tonight's forum is uh, sponsored by UA's Philosophy Department, uh, the Comfort Services, Arigat Club, University, um, you know, Honors College, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so we'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. Um, what we're going to do for tonight is we're going to start off with our speakers. Here we have John and Megan, um, and we're going to go into a, a time presentation and discussion. Uh, that will last about an hour. Um, we'll take um, about a minute or two after that to uh, focus on survey cards. You'll find them on the chairs here. Um, and we have a little shortage of pencils, so if you could share pencils, that'd be great. Um, but so after that time, we'll move into Q&A. We'll have a mic here in this aisle over here. Um, and we can just line up. Um, and I think that that's, uh, oh, and if you could, if you have a cell phone with you, please remember to keep them silent. Um, make sure there's no noise or flashes going on. That'd be great. That just helps to keep us focused here for tonight. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, I'll introduce our, our moderator tonight. Um, this is Hollis. Hollis is uh, on the Alaska Oil and Gas Commission. Uh, he's also served as Alaska State Senator. So I'll hand it over to Hollis. Hi, good evening. It's my job to introduce the two speakers. Uh, I'm going to do one introduction and, and then um, she will make a five minute presentation, I'll introduce the other speaker, he'll make a five minute presentation, and then we'll get into the, the actual debate. But I begin uh, by introducing uh, Dr. Megan Sullivan, who is uh, to my left. She is the O'Brien Collegiate Associate Professor of Philosophy at Notre Dame. And she's the director of the University Philosophy Requirement. She teaches courses at all levels, including large introductory courses in philosophy of religion and ethics, and specialized graduate seminars on metaphysics, philosophical logic, and rationality. She also works on developing the philosophy component of Notre Dame's core curriculum. Her research tends to focus on philosophical problems concerning time, modality, rational planning, and relig religious belief, but rarely all four at once. In case you're wondering how hard that would be. <clears throat> Dr. Sullivan earned her BA with highest distinction from the University of Virginia in 2005, double majoring in philosophy and politics. She studied at Virginia as a Jefferson Scholar. From 2005 to 2007, she studied at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, earning a Bachelor in Philosophy in Philosophy. Now, in case you were wondering that philosophers were, were over-specialized, you now know that only a Bachelor of Philosophy can be awarded in philosophy. Then from 2007 to 2011, she completed her PhD in philosophy at Rutgers. Her 2011 dissertation was on issues in the metaphysics and logic of change, entitled A Theory, A Theory. She was awarded tenure at Notre Dame in 2015. Dr. Sullivan has published work in many of the leading generalist philosoph philosophy journals, excuse me, philosophy journals, including New, Ethics and Philosophical Studies. You can read those papers at her website, megansullivan.org. She is currently finishing her first book, with, which deals with issues in diachronic rationality. I will personally be buying that book to find out what diachronic rationality is. <laughs> she also regularly writes short public philosophy essays, including publications in the Huffington Post, Commonweal and First Things, and gives public philosophy talks. Please welcome Dr. Megan Sullivan. Thanks for that introduction. I don't, know, I don't know how many of you guys heard that and thought, oh my god, I can't believe I came out in the rain for this, um, which would be a fair reaction. But I'm really glad you guys came out in the rain in this cold night to have this discussion. I think especially one of the conversations we've been having around campus all day is uh, with the recent election, realizing that our country is really divided on a lot of these big questions about what we value and what we're aiming for in our lives. So it gives me a lot of heart and hope to be out in Alaska tonight in an almost full room of people who are willing to come out and spend their free time trying to have a debate about this and a civil, interesting debate where we can make progress. I think a lot of people, when they find out that I teach at Notre Dame, 
automatically assume that I was raised Catholic or that I've always been Christian or very religious. If you know anything about Notre Dame, there are two things that you know. It's really, really religious and really, really into football. <laughs> and I spent most of my life interested in neither of those things, and I'm still not really that interested in football. Um, but I actually became a Christian in college. So I went to the University of Virginia, as, um, as Hollis said, and when I started college, uh, I come fr came from a background of what I best describe as kind of redneck atheists. Like, we weren't religious believers, but we didn't make a big deal out of it, like someone like Richard Dawkins. We just didn't believe in God. My parents didn't take me to church growing up. That was not a huge part of my upbringing, and, and I didn't really know very many religious people. And I arrived at college, and it was the fall of 2001, and two weeks into college, September 11th happened. And I didn't realize it at the time. Like, I didn't know anybody that lived in New York or Washington, D.C. I'm from North Carolina. It seemed like these events were happening a world away. But that was a really pivotal moment in my adult life, coming to be the, the woman that I became. And what happened was, as I was in that first year of college, I started taking moral considerations a lot more seriously. Behind my parents' back, I was switching from being a government major to gradually becoming a philosophy major. I started having a lot of questions about what my life means and whether or not I'm giving people what I really owe to them, and had a hard time finding answers to those questions. I also thought at this point in my life, I really wanted to study law and become an attorney eventually. And I kept coming back to thinking about the people in the World Trade Center on the day of September 11th. I became, now I look back, and, like almost obsessed with this question of like, there were all these people that had this job that was, ex all that I wanted in my life was to be a big time attorney in Manhattan, having never been to Manhattan. That's all I wanted. And that one day, like, you could just come to work and be annihilated, like, for, for seemingly no reason. I just couldn't get over that. And I thought more and more about it. And the anniversary of September 11th, that was the first time that I went to church. And it was one of these things. I remember this day really vividly. I'd been thinking about uh, the victims of the World Trade Center, and I'd been having all these like philo intro philosophy major questions. Do we have a lot of philosophy majors in the audience? I feel like this is what sets you on the course of being a philosophy major. You start worrying about this when you're 18. And I went, uh, decided I wasn't finding answers in the philosophy that I was reading. I wasn't finding it from my parents, though they really loved me and wanted to talk about some of these issues with me. Wanted to look somewhere else. There was a Catholic church near my dorm, and I figured, like, who says profound things about major world events on the anniversary of them occurring? Church people, like Jesus people. This is all they do. In my mind, that's what, like, happened at church, is there was going to be somebody that would give some, like, profound, heart-wrenching speech, and it would make me feel better about these questions that I was having. So I go to Mass, and it's, like, a Wednesday. Are any Catholics in the audience? It's totally fine if not. So, like, you know... Wednesday, Mass, it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, the anniversary of the American Revolution. If it's a weekday Mass, there are not going to be any profound speeches. It's like me, four old ladies, a priest, they kind of go through the liturgy, say some prayers that I didn't know, um, very short homily, and then we all left. And I remember leaving that thinking, well, that wasn't what I expected. Like, I was expecting a kind of philosophy talk, minus. But something about this feels really right. Like this felt like the right kind of place to be. There's something going on for these people that I don't really understand, but I want to know more about. So I started going back to church. And like a lot of people, like very few people have this kind of Pauline conversion. But I felt drawn to it and started going back. And then a year later, decided I wanted to be confirmed in the church, learned a lot more about it, thought I was ready to put my trust in, in, the, in what I'm teaching and my trust in the Bible. Remember, I'm doing this exactly the same time I'm getting really into my philosophy major. So at this period of my life, I feel like completely divided as a person. Because on the one hand, I'm finding a lot of truth and peace in Christianity, in my Christian faith. On the other hand, none of this makes any philosophical sense to me. And in fact, if I were asked to like, participate in a debate like this 10 years ago, I would have wet my pants. Um, because, you know, I'm starting to think that, like, I don't have answers to a lot of these questions. I don't really know what's going on for me. What I'm doing is deeply irrational and started to feel like I just needed to keep this kind of academic portion of my life and this personal portion of my life separate. It's taken me a long time, a lot of study, a lot of prayer, to realize that that's a mistake. 
that I think there is, in fact, a rational basis for this kind of faith. Even if at the end of the day nobody's converted ever by these philosophical arguments, you can use philosophy to bolster and deepen the Christian faith, and it can survive some of the biggest philosophical challenges. So one of the areas I'm hoping that we'll focus on tonight is trying to raise those challenges and see if really faith can survive this philosophical test. Um, I'll give you some of my reasons for thinking that these challenges I thought were really serious 10, 15 years ago actually are less serious to me now. Um, I think Professor McKay will, uh, will push a little bit further on that, but I'm hoping that we can have this big open discussion and that people will raise the questions that they really have. And, and if you guys don't have really difficult questions for me, I can suggest the ones that keep me up at night. But uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Wonderful introduction. Next, we'll hear from Dr. John Morricade, who is the Dean of the University Honors College and an Associate Professor of Philosophy here at UAA. Dr. Morricade completed a BA in Philosophy at Seattle Pacific University in 1995 and received his Master's in 1998 and PhD in 2000 from the University of Rochester. Dr. Morricade was a visiting professor for one year at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, before accepting a position as an assistant professor at Oklahoma Baptist University from 2001 to 2005. He relocated to Anchorage in 2005 after accepting a position in the philosophy department at UAA. Dr. Morricade was tenured and promoted to associate professor of philosophy in 2010 and served as chair of the philosophy department from 2009 to 2014. In August 2014, Dr. Morricade was appointed Dean of the University Honors College. Dr. Morricade has wide-ranging research interests both inside his area of specialization in ancient Greek philosophy and across the discipline. Dr. Morricade has published on Plato's moral psychology, Plato's political theory, Aristotle's metaphysics, Aristotle's biology, Socrates' moral psychology, and Stoic philosophy. Additionally, Dr. Morricade published a logic textbook, Logic and Problems. When not philosophizing and working with Honors College students, Dr. Morricade enjoys the wonderful recreation opportunities Alaska provides for him and his family. I can attest to that. I know he's a strong cross-country skier. He and I skied the Frosty uh, 25 a few years ago, and I have a picture uh, of him with one of those wonderful uh, uh, mustache icicles that goes almost all the way down to his chin. He is, uh, he is also He's also spread uh, uh, philosophy out into uh, a broader um, uh, audience by appearing on AM talk radio shows in segments titled, Ask a Philosopher. Please welcome Dr. Morricade. Uh, thank you, Hollis. Thank you, Hunter, for organizing this. And Joel, this is a wonderful event. And thank you, Megan, for coming up to participate. Uh, Megan and I have, it's sort of a, a tale of two philosophers and they go in opposite directions. So I grew up uh, fairly religious, uh, grew up going to Greek Orthodox Church and Catholic school. Uh, when I got into high school, I started uh, going to more evangelical churches and became very committed to that uh, approach. I went to a Christian college at Seattle Pacific University where I majored in philosophy. and. Uh, I saw no tension between philosophy and religion, and philosophy was a way of understanding the world, and religion was a way of understanding the world, and those frameworks worked really well for me. And I went off to graduate school, and all of a sudden, going from a Christian college to a secular college, uh, there weren't that many people who thought like I did. But I decided that uh, I was not going to get caught up in some existential crisis in graduate school, so I was just going to table any thought about uh, should I revise my own personal beliefs because there's really two different aspects to philosophy. One is learning and mastering the discipline and the other is sort of the personal growth and personal revision of your own beliefs. And graduate school is hard enough when you're just doing the first one of mastering the discipline and so I thought I'm just going to stick to that and I'm going to sort of put off the sort of introspective reflective part. And so my first job was at a Christian college. I taught at Calvin College in the philosophy department where you're supposed to sign a statement of faith. I never actually signed it. Um, I don't know if they know that. I think maybe one of the only people who went through there and didn't sign it. Uh, 
And then I got a job at Oklahoma Baptist University. And I like to joke that the Baptists did to me what philosophy never could. They drove me from religion. Um, <laughs> But, but what really started to happen is that um, as I, I was thinking about things, as I, going through it, what I was committed to was to having an intellectually honest faith. If I was going to be a person of faith, that faith had to be intellectually honest. And what that meant to me was that uh, it wasn't going to be based in what's comfortable. It wasn't going to be based in what I was afraid of. And I realized that when I thought about a godless universe, it frightened me. And I was afraid of letting go of that belief. And as long as I was afraid of letting go of that belief, I wasn't believing it for reasons. I was believing it out of fear. I was believing it for the comfort of the idea of an afterlife. You know, I'd lost people who I loved very dearly. And so the thought of them being, you know, taken to heaven by God and living this blissful existence brought me great comfort. And so I had to try and find a way to hold the belief in God, even if there wasn't such comfort. And even if I was, uh, if I could countenance a godless universe without fear, then I knew that I was doing it in an intellectually honest way. That was the standard I put myself to. And it took, a, it took a long time to be able to actually think about a universe without a god, without having a visceral reaction to it. Uh, but as I thought through it, and I sort of had to let go a lot of my ego, because part of what happens is when you think there's a god, there's someone, some all-powerful being, up there, master of the universe, who cares about you, who cares about me. That feels good, right? That feels really good. And to give up the idea that that's happening was hard, right? It's like giving up a sense of your self-importance, that my life had some cosmic meaning, right? That's part of the story, part of the Judeo-Christian story. And to think that, no, my life might not have meaning, and I had to be comfortable with that. And what happened was when I got comfortable with the idea of life being meaningless, of the universe being a swirl of dust dominated by physical laws and nothing else, as soon as I became comfortable with that, I no longer believed in God. And that's what happened. Now there are, uh, I could give you reasons and I could give you uh, part of what was going on along the way. So part of it was when I started thinking about what exactly would it mean for there to be a God, right? So I'm sort of thinking about these things. There'd have to be some being, right? And this being would have to somehow have some powers, and those powers are somehow supposed to be at work in this world, right? And, but where was that being? Is that being at a particular place? Was that being everywhere, right? Was that being not in space or time at all? And none of those options made sense to me. So also, as I got more comfortable with the notion that there wasn't a God, the deep mysteriousness and obscurity of the nature of God struck me more and more. So the notion of God as sort of something that makes sense of the world started slipping away at the same time, because the very notion of God ceased to make sense to me in a meaningful way. And along with that, as I witnessed these things, and as I witnessed the 9-11 attacks, my response was, this is a godless universe. No all-powerful, all-good being lets something like that happen. And you know what? That's not even that bad of a thing to happen historically. If you look back over human history, the amount of suffering and pain is unbelievable. Those of us in this room, we all have experienced tragedy, I imagine. We've all had pain. And we've all had some hard things in life that we don't understand. And we are among the most privileged people to ever live. We have the most comfortable lives. We have it as good as any human beings have ever had it. We are in the top 1% of the top 1% of human history. And for many of us, life is still a struggle. So think about the 600 billion people who have lived this planet before us and what it's like for them, right? Crawling out of the savanna, facing all of the battles, facing starvation, facing political imprisonment, facing genocide, the terrible and awful things. And I thought, you know, if someone just showed up at this world and looked around and took a look at how we treat each other and what happens, the rational conclusion would not be, this is a universe run by a loving, all-powerful God. And so as considerations like that, along with my comfort, that I finally was comfortable with the idea of letting go of my faith that led me to sort of just move away from religion. And I don't have any animosity towards religion. 
in particular. And I don't have any desire to make anyone else be an atheist. Some people need that comfort. Some people need that sense of purpose and meaning. And if you do, that's fine. But just don't tell me it's rational. Those were, those were our two introductions, and they were excellent introductions. That now brings us to the first uh, question to be addressed in tonight's debate, and that is, is there a God? Does God exist? And, and I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, and so I'll hope the, the two debaters will begin by defining what they mean or what we all think of when we say the word God. What is God? Does God exist? So I'll kick it off. And uh, John brought up the problem of evil, which is probably the, if we're treating this as like God on the dock kind of scenario, is the, the best argument the prosecution, one of the best, what I take to be the best argument the prosecution has. This is the one, one of the arguments that keeps me up at night as a philosopher and a Christian. I think to start to get a handle on this, first we should realize that very few Christians have really simple beliefs. So they just say like, My, I'm Christian because I believe that God exists and then they drop the mic. Most people, most Christians, <laughs> most Jews, most Muslims don't just believe that God exists. It gets weirder and crazier. They believe God exists. They believe God is three persons but one substance. That he lived in Jerusalem for a while and then was brutally murdered and then resurrected from the dead and he's resurrecting other people. Um, so oh, the Christian faith and in, in different ways but with similar complexity, Muslim and Jewish faith, is a complex and like really thick kind of faith. And that's problematic sometimes when we're trying to defend the rationality of it because there are lots of different planks that you can start to punch holes in. Uh, and I'm sensitive to that. But I think the complexity of the faith can also be helpful when we're trying to think about how we're going to respond to something like the problem of evil. And here, I'll report how I think about it. It's a philosophical problem I wrestle with, so I'm not going to say that I feel like I've definitively solved it for myself, but I've gotten to a position where I'm comfortable that I have a ra like, I'm on the track of having a rational response. But I think when you think about the argument from evil, so the simplest form, if God exists, he's all-powerful and perfectly moral, an all-powerful, perfectly moral agent would prevent any instances of suffering that it could, but there are lots of instances of suffering that are not prevented in our world, so there's no such God. It's a simple, there are more complex versions, but that's a, that's a pretty straightforward one. How do we go about responding to it? There are kind of four big strategies in philosophy, and I think we're entitled to use all four as Christians when we're trying to respond to it. A lot of people in philosophy like, if you've got a simple argument, you want to match it with like a knockdown simple answer, but some problems in philosophy just don't work that way. The one side has a really simple to express argument, the other side needs a lot more work to get their case going. I think that's the case with the problem of evil. So I don't want to bore you guys all night by going into all the details of the solution, but I'll sketch out like the four things I think Christians can say that start to give them a rational response to the problem of evil. Part of it is the free will defense. So part of it has to be the case that like God gave us, because he loves us, a certain kind of really powerful freedom and gave us the potential to abuse it. There are some religious traditions that don't acknowledge that extreme kind of freedom, and, and I respect that, but as a Catholic, I think part of the explanation for why God would permit some evils in the world has to be that we humans are abusing our free will. But that's only gonna give us a little piece of the puzzle. It's certainly not gonna get us all the forms of animal suffering that have nothing to do with human beings, or suffering that comes about because of natural disasters that have nothing to do with human beings. So you have to be able to marshal more of an answer if you want a full solution to the problem of evil. So the second part has to be some kind of limited skepticism about our ability to understand value in this world and, and, and what makes something a real evil. And this is something that I find really tricky. I know a lot of Christians, a lot of Catholics, who are happy to respond to the problem of evil by saying, like, God has a plan. So God, there's something great that came out of September 11th that outweighs all of the awful things that happened because of it, and we just can't see it. I have some sympathy for that approach, but I'm also suspicious of any kind of Christian faith that says we don't have really reliable moral detectors within us, because I think a lot of people come to the Christian faith thinking like, there's, like me, like there's some value that I'm missing out on, and I have to go seek it, and I have to behave morally in this world, and if you're always in the mindset of thinking like, 
you know, you're not a good, you're not good at detecting when evils are happening, then you're not going to have that moral motivation to be part of the faith to begin with. So that's only, again, a little piece of the responding to the problem of evil. The last two parts are the ones that get us more into theology. And this is where I think the complexity of our faith actually becomes something that makes it strong. So a third approach to the problem of evil is understanding, like, God is transcendent. God is a really weird part of our reality, a difficult to understand part with plans and intentions that may not, like he may not just feel the reason to make always clear to us. That's also gotta be part of the solution and that ties with the, the skepticism about our ability to always detect what God's reasons would be. But the final part, and this is the part we almost never bring up in philosophy courses. When I was learning how to teach philosophy, we were told patently never to bring this up, but I'll bring it up to you guys today. Uh, is the fourth part has to be a theological answer. So it's not like it's news to Christianity or Islam or Judaism, but especially Christianity, that there's suffering in the world. Like it's a religion that is obsessed with suffering. The Old Testament, the Gospels, the rest of the New Testament, we're constantly talking about suffering. We're learning how to like lament to God all of the awful suffering that we, uh, that we appreciate in the world. We're asked to constantly dwell on the suffering of God himself, and we're asked to see redemption in that suffering. That's not, like, the reason why we don't teach this in philosophy courses is because it's not obvious how we map that kind of value system onto our existing philosophical categories. It, you know, it doesn't make sense when we teach people, like, the good life is one where you're pursuing pleasure and achievements, and that a good life, like, somebody like Christ could lead up a good life that as, involves a great deal of torture. But it's part of like being in the faith that you commit yourself to looking and seeing some new kind of category of value in that kind of suffering. And I think any, any Christian who wrestles with the problem of evil is ultimately at the end of the day going to find part of their answer in thinking like there are these claims of my faith that I have a hard time necessarily, I, I might have a hard time translating to people who are not already part of this thick faith, but within the faith I'm getting, I'm getting answers about this. Which gets us to one last point, and then I will get, I'll give it over to John. Which is, what are we doing when we ask this question about whether a faith is rational? And I think there are two ways of asking the question. One is, can I give convincing arguments to somebody who's not already in my camp that would convince them to move over? So can I give a solution to the problem of evil that would convince even the most ardent atheist that Christianity is rational? I don't, I don't think I can do that. Uh, maybe you guys can, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd really love to hear that argument. But another reason why we do philosophy and we ask questions about rationality is just asking like, are my big complicated belief system, is it defensible and is it internally consistent or does it face some deep internal inconsistency? I think when Christians wrestle with the problem of evil, they're usually wrestling it with that, with like, in that mode. You're thinking like, I believe these things about God, but I know these things about my moral reality. How do I fit this all back together? And I think the theological solution also promises to give us ways of like trying to make our own views consistent again, even if by appealing to theology, we can't always convince other people of our views. Okay, thanks. So um, you know, the free will defense was first developed by St. Augustine. And in fact, free will was first invented by St. Augustine until he encountered the problem of evil and had to find a way to God, get God off the hook. Uh, no one had thought about free will. It's not a concept that exists in the ancient Greek and ancient Roman world. So the very notion of free will was created to solve the problem of evil. Uh, but how good of a solution is it? Right? You know, I can understand that there's free will and it can do something to give us value in our relationships. Do I choose to be honest to my friend? Do I choose to be loyal? Those are meaningful things. But, but if you're an all-powerful being, couldn't you give freedom like that but yet not give freedom for people to rape children? What value is there? What moral value is there in saying, hey, you know, I decided not to rape a child today. I'm free to do that. And many people actually choose to do that. So the free will that we're given doesn't explain a lot of the suffering that occurs because the free will has no positive value. We have the ability to choose to do horrific things and when we abstain from choosing them, we don't get a pat on the back, we aren't better people. So in many, many cases, we have free will that only has a negative side to it. Right? And if you think about all the awful things people do to each other, 
a lot of the ways that we exercise our free will is in that awful negative way. So if God could choose to give us free will, he could have put certain parameters on it. He could have constrained it in certain ways. He could have made it that we could not even conceive of genocide. He could have made it that we could not even conceive of rape or be psychologically capable of molesting children. But he chose, if he created us the way we are, to give us the freedom to molest children. And I see no value in that, right? And if you think, well, this is, we're gonna let these things happen so that people can learn, right? And if God is supposed to be a type of father figure, we could consider this a parenting strategy, right? So I've got my two older boys sitting right here. Uh, and you know, I would never leave a loaded gun out on the kitchen counter, giving them the option to pick it up and shoot their brother uh, because they'd really learn from that terrible incident. I just, that's just not an option I would build into how I raise my children. But God gave us that option and many worse ones. So free will is actually a flaw and not a feature of human life. Free will leads to more harm than good as it's currently given to us. And even if that's not true, free will could have been constructed by an all-powerful being to limit us so that we only had free will in ways that were morally significant and not in the morally insignificant ways. And a couple of the other points, one of it, this idea about God being transcendent or that understanding it requires a faith perspective is ultimately to say, I mean, one of the, the transcendence of God is just to play the mystery card and the mystery card is not an explanation, right? It, 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 that's not a, a rational defense. It's just to say that God is beyond our understanding. Well, if God is beyond our understanding, well, we shouldn't believe things we don't understand. Right? And I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about belief like in the heart. I'm talking about belief in the head. I'm talking about a cognitive assent to something being true. If somebody says something to you that you don't understand, you know, like, uh, what was that, diachronic responsibility? If I say that diachronic responsibility is ultimately a modality of the human mind, you should not believe that what I said is true or false because you shouldn't understand it because I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> okay, so this notion of transcendence is not one that leads to rational defense. And then finally, if you take things, you say, well, you have to have the faith perspective to believe it, and you need this sort of internal consistency. And I do believe that there is a feature of rationality, which is that a system is internally consistent. But in that case, uh, all sorts of wacky, crazy systems of belief are internally consistent, right? The, um, whether it's things like Newtonian physics that we know don't match up with how the world is in a lot of ways, that's internally consistent. Euclidean geometry is incredibly internally consistent but it doesn't actually portray the universe. So internal consistency is a minimal constraint on a system being rational. It by itself does not make a system worth adopting. There are three things I wanna say, but I wanna make sure I remember all of them. I'm bad at that. Probably at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot the third one. That's all right, it'll come to me. First off, on, uh, on the free will defense, like I said, I don't, think, I don't think any sane Christian would try to put all of their eggs in one of these baskets for responding to the problem of evil, because I think the problem is just too complicated for that. And that makes us uncomfortable as philosophers, but sometimes we just face that. We, we, we have philosophical questions where we think there are answers on the other side, but they're, they're complicated. For debate purposes, though, we want to strengthen the free will defense in response to John's arguments. Here's a thought experiment I often give my students, and there's some division in the class about it, but I think it helps us at least start to appreciate how important our freedom is to us. So you imagine you're going to have a child, and there's this new technology that's developed. It's called the chip. And you can put the chip in your child's brain. It's a really painless procedure. It happens right after birth. And children that have the chip are guaranteed to always make the right decisions. So the chip controls it. If they're ever offered drugs, they're gonna say no. If they ever find themselves flirting with a really bad relationship, the chip is gonna divert them to someone better. The chip pretty much guarantees that on one metric, your child is gonna have a really wonderful life because she's never gonna make any mistakes, she's never gonna do anything wrong. And you might think, I, I don't think God would have given us free will in order to teach us so that we can have better lives because an all-powerful being could have given us better lives in a much more direct way than having to go through this kind of thing, complicated teaching process. But let's suppose you've got this option of giving your child the chip 
would you do it? You know, you're assuming she's always going to be moral. She's going to probably have a, a happier, in one sense, life as a result of never making poor decisions. Do you think this is the kind of thing that would be a no-brainer? Let's assume it's really cheap. Let's assume it's covered by Obamacare. Um, <laughs> would you do it? And I think at least, like, when I give this to my students, I don't know, show of hands, who would give their, their child the chip? We can do some, like, empirical. Who thinks, like, they have serious reservations? Like, they, they really wouldn't want to do it. I think the people that say no typically do it, like, you know, you're pressed to say why, you want what's best for your child, whatever. There's something valuable about your child being the author of her decisions and choices, even if at the end of the day some of those are bad, even if they're catastrophic. I mean, we can imagine, like, Chip Light, which says, like, she will try marijuana, but she'll never try heroin. Or she might, like, be a bully in school, but she'll never, like, murder someone. That's kind of the situation. We imagine, like, how could God toggle our freedom, and did he toggle it just right? I think, you know, the same way we have these reservations about this thought experiment, we might have reservations about how confident we are that we have the right degree of freedom or not. I, I, so I, I don't think those are like obvious counterexamples to the free will defense. On the transcendence point, this is tricky. So like some, some Christian practices and Christian faith put a lot of emphasis on transcendence. So people coming from apophatic traditions want to say like, we can't say anything true about God. God's so far beyond our understanding that we really shouldn't try to philosophize about him, at least in the search for truth kind of way. We should just accept that we live in a world where one part, the most important part of it is beyond our ken. I don't have that kind of Christian faith, so I don't think we should always drop the mystery bomb. I think there are lots of true things we can say about God. He loves us, he's three persons in one substance. Remember I said I have all these like crazy, complicated historical and metaphysical beliefs about God that I believe are true. But I think in some respects, we have to think that a being like God who's capable of creating the universe and everything in it has got to have a sense of rationality and morality that's much weirder than mine. And actually, one of the things I really love about doing philosophy in the Christian tradition, being aligned with the Christian tradition, is I think Christianity takes really seriously this idea that we make moral progress, that like we start off thinking about the world in some moral terms, but then we get a clear view of what really is valuable. We are, as, as Christians, we get locked into a, a, a kind of transcendent or more complete good uh, over time as we grow in our faith and we start to realize that things that we thought were good before actually weren't, and that's a sign of our lives going well. And I think in that respect, like, you know, divine transcendence makes a lot of sense. You think, you know, we keep thinking we have a grasp of what's good in our life. I keep thinking, like, if I get tenure, everything's going to be great. If I get married, if I can just make more money, everything's going to be great. If I can do all those at once, everything's going to be great. If I win a Rhodes Scholarship, I've, then everything's sweet for the rest of my life. And it's not. Like, we know this from experience. Every time the goalpost keeps moving. And this, for me, as a philosopher and as just a human being, leads me to believe there's God. If there is any good out there that I'm going after, it's got to be something that's beyond my understanding so far because everything I keep trying to put in its place disappoints me. And so for that, I think that, if we understand transcendence in that way, is not that, like, we can't say anything true about God, but instead there's, like, some kind of goodness out there that, like, I know is there and I'm moving towards it, but I can't make sense of it then that also helps me wrestle with something like the problem of evil. I forgot my third point, but I'm going to come back to it if I remember it. <laughs> so I think one of the things that this brings us to is, because um, Megan said, it's this notion of transcendence, is there's something good out there, I know not what, and I'm aiming for it. Um, and that's an actually really thin conception of God, not a thick conception of God. And, and you can believe there's something good out there and I'm aiming for it and I don't know what it is, and be an atheist. So, so that notion of transcendence, uh, when it gets watered down to that, uh, I have no quibble. If you want to call God some, some good out there that you don't quite understand that you're living your life in pursuit of, yeah, uh, we can do that. But if you're thinking of God as this uh, as tr divine and traditional theism, as this all-powerful, all-loving, all-good, eternal being who exists outside of space and time and through sheer acts of will creates a physical universe, right? I mean, I mean, you ever stop and think about that? I mean, we, we were brought up thinking these things, but we never realized how bizarre they are, that there's this eternal being that one morning woke up, so to speak, and thought, hey, maybe today I'll create a universe. Why would a perfect being, perfect being is one that would never change. What would cause God to change in such a way that he would create? I mean, that is a deep mystery of the no notion of a God that creates ex nihilo. 
And in fact, a lot of religions don't believe in a God that creates ex nihilo. And if you look at even the book of Genesis, God moved over the chaos and brought order to it. Right? It's, it's not a story of God bringing things into existence out of nothing. It's a story of him ordering the stuff that was already there. That makes a lot more sense. I can see how that would happen. But I'm not sure what would prompt a God that was eternal to all of a sudden decide, my room is kind of messy. It's time to straighten it up. Right? Um, so how does a perfect being, which is supposed to be immutable, unchanging, go from not being a creator to being a creator? Right? So th there are parts of that story that just don't, don't make sense to me and don't add up. And when you think about some of the thicker notions, some of these historical notions, uh, you know, a lot of you are students here. Uh, go talk to a his history professor and ask them, by what standards do you establish things as historically accurate or historically true? And the standards used by historians would not lead you to believe that there was anyone who died and rose again. Historically, the evidence isn't there for that. It is a, an act of faith to believe in that being historically accurate, not an act of reason, right? And so <clears throat> if it did, if the Bible was historically accurate, it would be a great resource. And the ways in which it is historically accurate, historians do use it as a great resource. There's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that's very insightful, very accurate depiction of ancient Palestinian culture. Uh, however, none of the historical methods can support any of the claims of the supernatural. So the thick beliefs, the thick historical beliefs having to do with the supernatural just aren't uh, supported in rational ways by historical inquiry. I feel out of my depth as a philosophy professor commenting on Middle Eastern historiography or like ancient Middle Eastern historical methods. Though I think this is a live question, and this goes into part of having a thick faith means you're open to evidence or lack of evidence on many different fronts. So this is something Christians, serious Christians have to face up to. I do feel comfortable as a philosopher talking about the immutability point, because this is the one that I love to think about. Uh, I think that there's an open debate in philosophy about what exactly divine immutability would amount to and what it means for something to change. That, that boring dissertation title that Hollis brought up is really a dissertation about the nature of change. Let's bracket that for a second. Just think about this question of why would it be rational for God to create the world? God's perfect in and of himself, so it's not like making anything would make him better. Like me making something really cool would make my life better. But for God, he doesn't need to, there's no way you could get better if you're already God. You're already, you've achieved it. You're maximum betterness. To so have this question of why would it ever be possibly rational for something like that to want to make a world like us, because you only typically rationally do something unless it's going to, if it's going to bring about some more good in the world, but God has no need for that. I think part of the answer to this question has to be having a theory we call in philosophy super arrogation, but this idea of like there's your duty, rationally or morally, and then there's the potential to go beyond that in good or beautiful ways. Um, and I think when we try to think about God's decision to create, maybe a really good analogy is thinking about a couple deciding to be parents. So you might imagine like a happy couple whose lives are going really well. I'm a Catholic, but I don't think they're morally obligated or anybody's morally obligated to become a parent. Um, but you, and you might think like they're, they're not reasoning that like having children is going to make our lives better in some discernible way or is going to like, you know, we're morally obligated or rationally obligated to increase some good in the world by having kids. But still they do it because they think like there's something beautiful and good over and above what I'm obligated morally or rationally to do in creating people, creating life. And that seems like a, a, a very natural chain of reasoning for me and something that could equally well apply to God. If you, open, if you, you know, have a concept of morality and rationality, it's thick enough to imagine there's like what God ought to do or is obligated to do, and then there's going above and beyond that. The creation was going above and beyond that. And that makes sense, or at least, it can be consistent in the way I said before. It's not obviously irrational to believe something like that. That's how I think about this puzzle. Um, and I think, I think it's one of the easier ones to wrestle with in, in the scheme of things compared with like, the problem of evil. Uh, I would also think you know, the issue of God being in space and time has come up quite a bit and how weird that is. I find as a philosopher, just everything is weird. It's weird that we say chairs exist rather than particles arranged chair-wise, and it's really weird that causation happens at all. So part of this, like some of this debate also becomes of like, 
like just reality is weird. Every, every seemingly complete, consistent picture of reality you get from anyone, from a naturalist, from a Christian, from anyone is just gonna have some like weird claims that you have to wrestle with. And I don't think in this, like, God is a very weird part of our reality if you believe God exists like I do. But it's not the case that he's like the only part of reality that's weird and that we struggle with as philosophers. There's like metaphysical questions around every turn. So I don't think I don't think just pointing out how that we have to answer these hard questions about how space and time work if God's in, in the world should be a deal breaker for anyone because we have to answer really hard questions about space and time no matter what. Speaking speaking of space and time, uh, about now we have to pivot to the second question that I'm posing to the philosophers tonight, and that is, is there life after death? And we'll start with Professor Morky. No. <laughs> no, there's not. And, but, let's, but let's give some reasons here. Uh, I think the question of whether or not there's life after death reduces to the question of, do we have or are we identical with an immaterial soul? And I think the answer to that question is no. And I'll give you some reasons for thinking that. Um, one, there's historical evidence and biological evidence that we have evolved from other animals, that our biological lineage and cognitive functions are the product of millions of years of natural forces at work through natural selection and genetic mutation. Uh, if you want to think at some point along the way, we hit a special place in evolution and an immaterial soul popped out of our brain, uh, that's a very strange thing to think. Uh, and and it's, so it's hard to square with those bodies of evidence. Second, the notion of being or having an immaterial soul is itself an incredibly difficult notion. Uh, it's hard to square with how things actually function. So if your mind, and think of mind and soul as interchangeable, if your mind is this immaterial thing, uh, why does it have trouble thinking uh, when you drink alcohol? Why does your mind have trouble functioning when you have a stroke? Why does this immaterial thing get affected by a hammer hitting you on the head? Right? There are all these physical things that impinge on the functioning of your mind. And that only makes sense if the mind is a physical thing. And with all of the work being done in cognitive science, we are discovering that the functions of thought are located in the brain and can be traced and tracked and repaired. Uh, through, through interventions. So it looks as though we are perfectly material beings. Just like your pet dog, your pet cat, your pet goldfish. Uh, and we have a lot in common with these other beings. Well, I think we share something like 92% of our DNA with rats. Uh, there are other animals that engage in verbal and nonverbal communication. There are other animals that use tools. There are other animals that engage in cooperative behavior. Uh, we are not as special in this universe as we've made ourselves out to be. We differ from things in degree. It's a difference of degree between us and the other higher mammals. It's not a difference of kind, right? We are not essentially unique and special. And, and this is like, this is the blow of atheism, is that we have to give up a lot of the great things we thought about ourselves and sort of realize that we are part of the natural order and, and that's what it boils down to. And as part of the natural order, uh, I believe as it says in the Old Testament, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. We, we come out of the dirt, we are made of the matter, and we return to the matter, and that's all there is to it. And the early, uh, it looks as though early Judaism did not believe in an afterlife. They believed in the body and the person as a completely physical being. And a completely physical being could not survive death. And it's one of the most difficult notions to give up because the idea of your loved ones surviving death and being in a comfortable place, that's, everyone wants that. Everyone wants to believe that, right? But the, the sad and hard truth is that when your dog dies, your dog is gone. And when your parents die, your parents are gone. It's over. And that is a very hard thing, and I think a lot of why we hold on to the belief in the afterlife is because it's so psychologically difficult to come to grips with someone actually being dead and gone. And it is painful, and it is tragic, and it hurts. And we don't want to hurt. So we create a system of belief that comforts us. 
And I think that belief in the afterlife is largely a way of coping with the tragedy of death. Dr. Sullivan. So, this will probably get me in trouble too with one of my religious leaders, but as a Catholic, you know, we get up at Mass every Sunday and we say we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come, and we're meant to sound really confident and excited when we say that. And I, I, be I believe in an afterlife. I, have, I subscribe to that part of the faith, but the part about looking forward to it or like getting solace from the afterlife, that escapes me entirely. Like the more I think and learn about heaven, the more scared I am. I know it's gonna be wonderful and I'm gonna be happy once I'm there and with God, but like when I think about what the tradition teaches about what heaven's gonna be like, you know, we're gonna be totally cleansed, we're gonna have new bodies. If Aquinas is right, they're gonna be spheres maybe. Uh, we're gonna be rebuilding Jerusalem and singing, but none of the stuff I love about this life is gonna be preserved in the afterlife if we take the Christian teaching seriously, or very few besides like my relationship with God and maybe my love for like my fellow man. But like watching Netflix is not, not gonna, like the things that I orient my life around towards now are all gonna disappear. So for these reasons, I find the afterlife actually really discomforting. But I still believe in it, partially because I believe and, and hope that there's this kind of moral transformation that's available even to people like me. Now there's this interesting question of whether the afterlife's possible. So I mostly believe in the afterlife because I have this hope for a moral transformation and because I believe the promise in the gospel. So I've subscribed to this tradition and believe what this tradition teaches about me and my life. There's this philosophical problem of, am I or you the kind of thing that could survive death? So suppose like I, uh, my body and all my psychological states cease to be realized, my body gradually decays, it's scattered to four corners of the universe, Maybe it's eaten by animals and some of it's distributed in the ocean, I'm just gone. <laughs> then, could it be the case that an all-powerful God thousands of years later could get me enough of whatever I am back together in order to enjoy this afterlife? I take that philosophical question very seriously, but I, that's one I feel like as a philosopher I have, I have better equipment to answer. So this gets us into this debate in philosophy. It's like a two-part debate. One is, what is it for a thing like you to last over time? Like, what does it take for you to persist over time? That's a question in metaphysics. Another question is like, what do you care about when you care about yourself persisting over time? So what would it be for there to be some person in heaven at the end of this that you recognize as you? And I think we have ways of answering both those questions, but when I try to answer those questions, I get driven more and more to the view that there's something about me that's, that's soul-like, it's an immaterial soul, that's not the picture of me that I get from materialism. So it would take me a whole philosophy talk to give you those answers, but I'll give you, like, you know, some of my quick reasons. Some a popular move in philosophy is to say, if you don't have, you're, you, what makes you, you over time isn't a soul, it's how connected up your psychological states are. So you, you've lasted your whole life because you remember being a child or you have this chain of memories that leads back to your childhood. You'll continue to exist even if you get a really significant diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, at least as long as you have your memory and psychological connections. But as soon as those go away, you're not you anymore. What you care about is being psychologically connected, or that's what you are. I hear this, and I teach this view from Locke to my students, but I don't buy it. Um, one, one reason why I don't believe it is I think there are lots of cases where it doesn't make sense of what we seem to really care about. So here's a real world case. There's a reporter, Susanna Cahalan. Have any of you guys read her book, Brain on Fire? This was like a New York Times bestseller last year. She's a reporter in her late 20s. She suddenly got encephalitis. Like very suddenly, she went from one day being a well-functioning, you know, and late 20-year-old reporter in New York, to the next day having complete loss of her memories, having these really violent seizures, like complete loss of her personality, and she was like this for a month or so until her doctor finally diagnosed her with encephalitis, and they started treating her encephalitis, and then she came back. There's like a huge break in her psychology. She had to go back and like watch the videos of herself in the hospital to figure out what she was like during that month. And she had to interview her caregivers. And you think, like you put yourself in Kaylin's position. You think, she's not connected up with the part of herself psychologically that, that's having this bad of encephalitis. But if I were in her shoes, I would really care what's happening to me then. And going back after the fact, I'd think that like, if I had made pl like, really long-term plans but then had to deal with this horrible encephalitis halfway through, I'd still care about what happens to myself after, at the end of those plans when I start to come back. I think I'm the kind of thing that could survive a huge sudden change in my psychology. 
And if you think like a month isn't long enough to really disrupt your psychology, give yourself imaginary encephalitis for a year or two years or five years. and Think like, do you think you could come back to that? And would you care what was happening to you during that episode? Some philosophers, I know some philosophers who want to say no. Like if you have that sudden change or break in your psychology, you have not survived. There's no reason to care about yourself. But I find myself imagining those scenarios and thinking I would obviously care about myself. So there's got to be something more to me that's not just like how connected up I am psychologically. I think similar kinds of examples can be given for how connected up I am bodily. Um, and for these reasons, you think like every time the materialist, naturalist owes us an answer of what we care about, a theory of what we are that helps us make sense of ourselves. I think there's lots of questions to be raised about what an immaterial soul is. I think it's I believe in modern psychology and neuropsychology, and I think it's pretty clear that there's a physical part of us that is involved a lot in our psychological lives. But I have not been convinced by any of the materialist theories that they've given me about what I am, that this is what I am, that this makes sense of how I think of myself. And so for these reasons, I'm not at all embarrassed to believe in souls or to believe that there's this part of me that's not just my psychology or my body. Excellent, excellent. We're going to turn now to student questions. We have uh, an opportunity for those of you in the audience to ask these two eminent philosophers uh, questions. And so we're just going to take one second and put this mic in that stand there. And we're going to uh, call up uh, Skylar King Strang and uh, Jacob Sherliff and Brandon Bachman are all here to ask questions. And anyone else who would like to ask a question, just take a, 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 a place in line here uh, behind the, uh, the microphone. But uh, uh, We'll, uh, we'll ask these folks to pose their questions. Uh, each uh, philosopher will answer them, and then if there's time, we'll take uh, questions from the audience as well. Do you want me to do this one? I think we can do that one right there. Hello. Uh, thank you both so much. I have a huge philosophical question. Um, my question is, for uh, Dr. Sullivan. I'm curious, John uh, represented your view of God as being one outside of time, and I know that you're a time theorist. You also said that time is sort of a weird uh, concept, especially when related to that. I'm curious if you think that God being outside of time is consistent with your conception of God, and if not, uh, or if it is, how does God interact with us on a present level? This is an awesome question, and one that I'm always afraid to get, because <laughs> I feel like I should know, I should have like talking points, but I really don't. In fact, I get invited to conferences as a philosopher of time. People find out that I'm interested in religion and that I primarily work in philosophy of time, and I'll often get asked to give papers at philosophy conferences on this topic, and I'm like, I don't have a paper. <laughs> but I have, I have some thoughts. So. Uh, in this part, I'm not a theologian, so take this with a grain of salt. This is me as a philosopher who's interested in these questions, trying to figure out what to believe. But I'm sure theologians have worked more on, on people who've studied the nature of God more ha have better answers to this. I think uh, it's an open question for me whether God is inside of time or outside of time, and that's not like a deal breaker either way for the most important parts of my Christian faith. Um, so I, I kind of just don't know on that question. Uh, I do think there has to be some sense, if you believe in a Trinitarian God, who's like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Son and Holy Spirit parts at least have been temporal in some really robust way at certain points for us to make sense of that part of theology. So in that respect, there ha we have to be willing to put God in time in a really robust way uh, to make sense of the Trinitarian part of Christianity. Um, so that's the, I guess that's the part of my answer. And then I say, like, I, I think there are interesting questions about what it is for time to pass and whether or not time is the kind of thing where an all-powerful God could take in all of it at once and what that would mean for human freedom. The questions about whether God is in space and time, those don't really keep me up at night. But the question about like, how, God, how much God knows about the future and whether the future is out there for God to comprehend in some important way and the ways that that would challenge my ability to think of my freedom, that's a question which I don't have a pithy answer to, but it is one that keeps me up at night. This is one of these areas where I don't have my theology completely worked out, and I think that's an area where there's a real tension and I don't know what to think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob. Uh, I'm a member of the university's honors college, and, um, so I might be a little biased in the fact that uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Morgan. So, 
Yeah. So he, he made this argument earlier about there probably wasn't a certain time in terms of evolution where all of a sudden like we we get reason and then we distinguish ourselves from the rest of um, the animal world, if you want to call it that. And there have been interactions between you know humans and, and gorillas where they have communicated through sign language and there are interactions between humans and dolphins where they are starting to communicate and, and we think that there's like cognitively more going on there outside the fact that many animals have very complex ways that they organize themselves and interact with the world. So when recognizing that, is it more likely that the progression of evolution just at the time in which we view a very narrow portion of history is more likely that these are like these groups of, of, of organisms are far more similar to us and potentially could reason in the future and have, have this capability, or is it more likely, uh, in your opinion, that uh, God just created these beings to like confuse humans um, or to like exist so that humans could interact with them, but when they die, they just like turn into the dust, um, and like a gorilla doesn't go to gorilla heaven, um, but like if I had like sworn my oath um, to him and I believe in him, like I uh, then go to heaven. Do, do you want me to jump in on that first? <laughs> yeah, because I don't think anyone goes to heaven, so that's yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, like, put this on the table. I believe in evolution. I believe, uh, you know, to the extent that I know about it. And again, I, I'm a, I'm an even worse evolutionary biologist than I am a Middle Eastern historian. So, but I, I trust that what my colleagues in evolutionary biology are doing is uh, is really good work and is helping us get a sense of our prehistory. So, believing in evolution raises a lot of theological questions, some messier than others. The way I think about this question is we imagine there's this huge, long human prehistory. And at a certain point in that history, these organisms, some subset of them, have to start having dignity. A dignity in the sense that like, God recognizes them as his children, that would be the metaphor that the biblical metaphor would use. But they're the kinds of things that could have afterlives, that could have souls, that could be resurrected, that could be in a special relationship with God. And the puzzle for the Christian is to explain at what point in this evolutionary process something would have happened where God would shuffle from not caring about these creatures in this special way to suddenly caring about them. And that has to be a kind of sharp transition because you can't like halfway get resurrected or halfway be it something that God's concerned with. So that's a puzzle. How do we start to solve it? One, I don't think like the basis of our dignity should be our cognitive capacities like vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of organisms because I think you know, there are lots of humans that have dignity right now that don't have cognitive capacities um, that would like match a dog or a gorilla. So that can't be what the basis of human dignity is. It has to be something more mysterious that was going on with God when he decided to start counting these things. Uh, what that is, this is where I like punt transcendence thing. It's something about like something God sees in us that we don't quite, that we're not able to theorize in ourselves. Next question is like whether you think it'd be totally, so imagine like, I wish I had that chart of like the rise of man, you know, you got like, like the organism, you guys have all seen this. Like at what point did God start caring? in that evolutionary process, or start thinking that we had dignity, or what point did he realize before he created us, like this is the point when the dignity people are gonna appear on the scene. And there are answers to this, like so I've, I've read some philosophers of religion wanna say like it just happened miraculously, like bam, the first like hominid was born that had dignity, and it just like miraculously appeared, God, or God caused it to appear. I think another answer, one that I'm more tempted to, but I'm sure has theological problems, and like I said, I don't have all this worked out, is this idea that it's perfectly rational? It's it's perfectly fine for a rational or moral agent to sometimes draw arbitrary distinctions in what they care about. So here's an, an example. This one comes from a philosopher named Peter Van Inwagen. You can imagine, like, what's your name again? Jacob. Jacob, you commit a crime, bad. And I'm a judge, and I have to sentence you to prison. That's the just sentence. Um, you've got to do some time for your crime. And I have to sentence you to a certain number of days. And let's suppose your crime was like assault. So I'm, you know, I'm entertaining just sentences for assault. I think a million days in prison would be unjust. That's too much. Two days in prison, also unjust, because that's far too little. The right answer has to be somewhere in the middle. So I settle on like 720 days in prison. And you come to me and say like, well look, from the standpoint of justice, 719 might be just enough, but you know, a day out of prison would make a big difference for me, so maybe you should decrease my sentence by one. 
and I listen to your argument, and I, I you know, go along with it. And then you come back to me for an appeal the next day, and you do what's called in, in philosophy of logic a forced march sororities. You basically march me down to a number that's unjustly low. And the only way to get out of a forced march, or they're, they're you know, modulo, some really fancy logical maneuvers, is to just draw an arbitrary cutoff. For me as the judge, I just put down my foot and say, look, look 720, that's the number I'm sticking with. I, I buy your argument, but I have to make a decision somewhere, and this is the decision. I think if you believe that morality and rationality can sometimes tolerate these kinds of arbitrary cutoffs, then you, can, you also have some ways of answering this evolutionary problem of like, God had to make a decision in creating us that there was gonna be some sharp cutoff where we were gonna have what he calls dignity. And he's not doing anything irrational or immoral or denying anything about reality when he decides this is the point in evolution where things have dignity. Um, so another possible answer to it, this doesn't require like, you know, sudden difference in the kinds of organisms that God is considering. Uh, it's one, that, you know, it depends on this moral, rational framework I'm trying to sell you, which you, I, yeah, I struggle with in certain frames of mind. But I, this is just to point out, there are sophisticated answers to these kinds of questions. We don't have to like revert back to young earth creationism or anything like that to try to make these views work. Hello, my name is Ben. Thank you both for your very informative uh, argumentation. My question is for Dr. Sullivan. I'm sorry to get you three questions. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully, someone else can yeah, do that a bit more. Um, my question is regarding the afterlife. Now, the perspective you brought to us is very much in line with Western thinking towards the afterlife, like the concept of it. But as you and I both know, that differs greatly with the Central and Eastern Asian concepts of the afterlife, with the Hindus for the reincarnation, etc. Um, and that differs greatly with the old Native American concepts towards natural animism. So I was wondering, how do you kind of reconcile these different uh, conditions? Because the way I see it, only three possible outcomes are true. Either one afterlife is correct and all the others are wrong and it kind of just sucks for everybody else, or all afterlifes are simultaneously true and when you die, people of different religions and cultures kind of just get plugged into their categories, or there's no afterlife. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that. Thank you. This is a good question. So I'm of the mindset that, that one of us is right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which seems like hard, you know, it seems, it feels like intolerant or somehow offensive to say that, because I actually have huge respect for, um, for people that are really seriously invested in these other traditions that have incompatible views on the afterlife than I do. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why we feel so reluctant to, to make claims like this, like one of us is right about this and I hope it's me, is because you know, we, we sometimes get confused about what it is to tolerate difference on these big theological questions. Like I think part of, I've got a graduate student who's very seriously interested in, uh, in Buddhism and we talk about these issues a lot. And I think part of respecting her commitments is saying that like I take it that, you're, that you might be right that this is the reality for what it is to be a person and this is what we're really aiming with and I could be wrong. Like there could be something true about what you're saying. And, Part of being really invested in a lot of these thick faiths is also making claims to exclusivity, like saying like if, if, if this turns out to be true, then, the, then this other hypothesis can't be. We can have those discussions in a really civil way, like listening to each other, wanting to learn, being open-minded and saying like, look, at the end of the day, if I start getting a lot of evidence that, that your tradition has got the right hypothesis, I could move. It's very hard to move people because the kinds of evidence involved in these, it's not, it's not the usual kind of evidence that, that changes people's mind, but it's possible. And I still respect you as a person and as a believer and realize that you have really different evidence for the kinds of views that you hold. But at the end of the day, like we might have to face up with the decision that one of us is wrong and that, that's just kind of an intellectual consequence of the view that I've got. And not one that I, I mean in any way to like offend you in your tradition or think that you've been irrational in pursuing this because I don't have the same starting points as you do. But that's, that's where I come down on the claim. I mean, and I'm also, I mean, I'm, in principle, I don't have like credence one in the, the credence one in philosophy is like, I believe this and absolutely nothing could possibly happen that would ever cause me to change my mind about it ever. I don't approach this question like that. I think like at the end of the, you know, it might turn out that we all die and then we just never get the phone call. <laughs> and there, there wasn't an afterlife after all. I hope that's not the case. It's part of having faith, but like, you know, intellectually that's, a, that's some probability that, that that could happen for me. This is a question for both of you. My name is Justin, and uh, my question is, why is there something 
rather than nothing? I'll go first on that one. Um, so, so part of it is, uh, you could think of it in this way, that it's simply a precondition for you asking that question is that there has to be something. Because in a universe where there's nothing, you can't even raise the question. So in a sense, there being something rather than nothing is a precondition for thinking and asking the question. Um, but if you're wondering, like, why is there a universe rather than not one, uh, I, I don't know that there's a sensible answer to that. Why isn't it just empty space and nothing, nothing physical? Um, I, I don't think anyone has an explanation for that. Even if you think that there's a God, you could just move back. Why is there a God instead of no God and nothing? And that's, I think that that's asking for an explanation for something where you can't, where you can't find an explanation. Um, and, then, and then just like a little bit of an aside on this, one of the things I'd like to say about this is I hope I'm wrong on both counts. Um, I hope there is a God, and I hope there is an afterlife, because I think that's a better world than one without them. And so it's like with much regret and remorse that I've come to these conclusions. I'm not like, yay, there's no God. Isn't that awesome? No, it's, it, so I just want to sort of get that out there, because sometimes my tone might make it seem like I'm so happy that there's no afterlife. No, I would love to keep going. I like being alive, so. <laughs> I, uh, I largely agree with John and the like everybody's got this problem if you're if you're really in the grips of what we might call in philosophy like the principle of sufficient reason of like getting an answer to all of your why questions you either have this question of why is there a universe or this question of why is there God and and like both sides have a hard time answering their ultimate why question and the cheeky answer and like uh, first order logic, the kind of basic logic you learn in, uh, in the first couple years of philosophy, one of, the, one of the proofs you do about two thirds of the way in proves the necessary existence of something. So I always tell my students it's just like a logical truth that there's something. I was accused of philosophical malpractice one time for saying, because you, you can reject that logic obviously. But, but this is a question I think, I, I don't find myself in the grips of the principle of sufficient reason or this kind of thinking that like every why question will be given a satisfactory answer. I think uh, there is no satisfactory answer to the why is there God question. It's just that there is. Um, so it's, this is one that like I think we might have to punt on it being able to give you an answer to. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you guys for being out here. My name is Luke Cohen. My question is for Dr. Sullivan. Um, Murphy, actually you brought this up, and that's, that's why I don't think you actually answered to it, but um, you know, the soul is a material. Yeah. Um, he brought up that when we're intoxicated by drugs or any other intoxicants, we are afflicted, our mind and our soul is afflicted. But when we're dead and we die, our soul isn't afflicted, uh, afflicted consistently with that, but instead of least. How can you answer to that inconsistency? Yeah, so you know, you've got the, anybody that believes in souls like I do, uh, one owes you, an exp owes you a bit more theory of what a soul is. Like, is it an immaterial object? How is it related to the mind? How is it related to the body? I have to say, I, I believe in souls, but I don't have a full-blown version of substance dualism to give you. I think I, uh, I get drunk when I get intoxicated, like everybody else, so it's got to mean that like, some part of me and my psychological functioning is physical and is able to be like, affected by chemicals in these ways. Likewise, I get hit by a hammer, I forget things. So it's clear that like, some important, if, if, arguably the most important part of my thinking is happening up here in a physical thing, my brain, my cerebellum. There's this further question of like, am I my brain? Which, I, what I was trying to argue is I don't think materials have given me a satisfactory answer to it, and at least not one that explains what I believe about myself. Now, in heaven, there's an interesting question about how like, you know, the souls and the new bodies or the resurrected bodies are gonna get connected in heaven, and what, why exactly you'd need bodies in heaven if you have a soul. It's a big question that a lot of thinkers from like, medieval times are concerned with. Um, those I have no good answer to, but, but I don't think this is embarrassing for me, because like I said, I think part of taking the Christian faith seriously is actually being much more weirded out about the afterlife and this thing that we're hoping, hoping for than the view that we're traditionally given. Like the afterlife is not going to be like, like the Simpsons. There's this great episode of the Simpsons where they've got Protestant heaven and Catholic heaven, and the Protestant heaven is kind of like a stuffy country club, and Catholic heaven is like people on trampolines. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> 
those are great, but that, neither of those are actual heaven. Whatever heaven's going to be like, it's going to be like just radically different from this life that we're living and the things that we pursue in this life and the ways that we use our body in this life and the way that we think. It's, it's just going to be so profoundly different. So I think like, you know, that might be a question where all of our philosophizing is not even going to give us an answer because we're trying to philosophize about something where we have only little glimmers of information about what it's going to be like. But that's, a, that's okay. That's not enough to like, not want it. Hi, okay, wow, this is weird. Okay, so my, my name is Janelle, and thank you both for being here. My question is for you, Dr. Norcade, and I'm going to be completely honest, I'm really nervous about what you're going to say in response to this. I'm like, what is, what is he going to do? Me too. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I want to go up and ask, but I will, so okay. So I'm curious what your thoughts are to Dr. Salvin's response to when you were talking about how God had to have changed in order to create the universe, because as a perfect being, he just, like you said, like, so to speak, he woke up one day and decided to create the universe. And if you recall, Dr. Salvin, you mentioned how he, if, I mean, correct me if I'm mistaken, but that he wanted to create it because he wanted to, he thought that it would be good and that it would be beautiful and etc. So again, Dr. Markey, what, what are your thoughts on Dr. Sullivan's response to you there? Yeah, I thought that she actually dodged the question because it sounded like God went from being just a regular moral being to being a supererogatory moral being, and why would that have happened then? And if God was a supererogatory moral being all along, then he would have created earlier. So it didn't address, it addressed the question of like, why would God create at all? Um, and in a certain way by drawing analogies with parenthood, which you may or may not think apply, but it didn't explain the idea that it had to happen at a point in the divine history. Um, and that's, that's sort of mysterious to me, that all of a sudden God realized, oh, I'm not just good, I'm really good. I better create something. That strikes me as, as odd. Um, but also I think the parallel with parents, um, you know, when parents have children, I think that they, they might not believe that they're doing it to improve their lives. I think most actually do believe that, but they probably do think that they are bringing the world into a better state by having and raising children. Uh, and in fact, God being perfect, when he created, he created something imperfect. And so he, he tarnished the reality of the universe as it was uh, prior to creation. So he made the totality of what there was worse than it was, because God alone is better than God plus this imperfect mess that we live in. You probably want to respond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I'm not a parent, so I feel weird like giving parents advice on, or describing intentions to parents, because I've never been in the trenches. But I, 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 like, I do, I'm a godmother. Um, I do get the sense at least some people decide to have children, not thinking that it's gonna make their lives particularly better, not thinking that they're morally obligated to do it, and not wonderful children aside, thinking that their offspring are going to make the, or like being assured that their offspring are gonna make the world better. They do it because just like, creating life is a good, but totally not required, totally optional thing. And we have to have moral categories that allow for that, I think. And I think once we admit of those kinds of categories, there's no such thing as like, being super supererogatory. Like, you know, it's not the case that like somebody who has one child for these reasons would have been way better off if they'd had 40. Because uh, they're just like making more good but unnecessary things. That's not how the, we're, once we talk about this category, we're talking about things that don't add up in this way anymore. Um, so I take that seriously and I think this gives an explanation for like why would God create. Now you have the like why would God create at this time rather than this other time, which gets us into this sticky wicket of like is God in time and did God have time before he created? Which again, I think, I don't have a convincing evidence either way for saying that. Yeah? <laughs> I, I just cannot not say something. What if God is always creating? What if his nature is to always create? So it's not some better God, but it's some God that's always creating, and you don't even know where he's creating everything. That's, that's something neither of you talked about. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's a conversation. We have about five more minutes. 
The philosophers will be available after the event, but I don't want to abuse uh, the people here or here to hear the whole presentation. So we're now in the lightning rounds where you have to condense your question down as tightly as possible, and we'll try to get the answers in, this, in a way so we can get to the end of the line. And the Go answers, ahead. And the answers, too. <laughs> my name's Sean Farr. I'm a Christian. My question is directed at Dr. Morcott. So C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had he got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? Where does good come from? You seem to presuppose that evil was around, but where does the concept of good come from, and love, and things like that? Okay, yeah, yeah no, I'm familiar with this argument from C.S. Lewis. It's the idea that, uh, that there can only be the existence of morality or goodness if God exists, and I just completely reject that inference, that uh, you can have morality and goodness as uh, defined through uh, evolutionary processes that lead us to have certain levels of social cooperation. Love has an evolutionary benefit because if people don't bind together and raise their offspring, they don't pass on their genes. So there are lots of ways to come up with notions of right and wrong that don't involve being handed clay tablets with them written down. Lightning round, we gotta go. Who <laughs> next? Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to make it short. You said you didn't believe that um, God exists physically in the world because there's no proof of it. Um, no historical proof. My question for you is, do you believe in, um, and this might be a, a small exchange, and I want Hollis Fritch to, to, to weigh in on this as a lawyer. Um, <laughs> as, um, do you believe in eyewitness accounts that are written down as part of history? Uh, and so, so, in court, do you, are they yeah. counted as part of history? So, okay, so a couple things. One is, uh, I didn't say that I don't believe that God exists because there's not historical evidence. I don't believe in the historical aspects of thick faith because there, the historicity isn't there. So there might still be a God, but the historical parts like that, that particular events happened. And as far as eyewitness accounts, uh, research has shown that eyewitness accounts are some of the least reliable accounts that there are. And none of the accounts that we have from uh, the time of following the life of Jesus were written anywhere near the time when they happened. So they were written 40 to 80 years after. Which is closer than any other historical document for anything that happened in the world. So like, um, uh, so yeah, that's just my point, is that we believe in the Do you read the newspaper? <laughs> I mean, in the, in the point of history. So. Okay. The short answer is they're extremely persuasive to juries. There's no doubt about it. I, I was a trial attorney, and I can promise you that's how you win cases. But but Dr. Morricade is right. I I witness, uh, especially when it comes to who did it. Who you know, facial recognition is a problem. Although in general, most eyewitness accounts turn out to be true. Last question. It comes to you. Hi, my name is Neil. My question is that, uh, to both of you: at what, to what extent do you have a duty to be agnostic in your beliefs? At what point? Like, can you say normally that there is not a God? And at what point can you say that believing in this God is to be to, is to heaven? Like, how much agnosticism do you think has to exist in beliefs, considering what we know? Sure. Um, so I don't suppose. Like, I, I think faith. This is a question that's been percolating in the back of this whole debate, but never really came up to the fore. And it's sad that it's coming in like the the lightning, lightning, lightning round. But there's this question of what kind of faith you need to be saved and what it means to, to be a Christian. And I think sometimes those questions are treated as really cut and dry in debates like this when actually they're very complicated. What is it to be a person of faith? What is it to care about God or love God? And how obvious is it? And what are your intellectual and emotional commitments? So I don't want to put down like a litmus test of saying like if you do this, you're in, and if you don't, you're out, and this is what you absolutely have to believe, come what may. Um, I think even believing core tenets of the Christian faith, like that God exists and that Jesus is God and that Jesus did these things, are kinds of things you can believe intellectually and emotionally, but still have lots of questions about what they mean and how to properly understand them. And like real serious Christians are always wrestling with those questions. In that sense, I think 
even really serious committed Christian faith requires a sense of doubt. Doubt is like, you know, you're learning more and understanding more of these really weird truths all the time. I'm very moved by Mary's passages about Mary in the Bible and this idea that she got this like huge truth bomb dropped on her very suddenly about the history of the world and God. And she didn't understand it, but she just held it all in her heart. There's that passage. She like just kept thinking about it and trying to figure it out. That's how I, I view this. Um, now, if you mean agnosticism is just like suspending judgment of saying like 50-50, God exists, 50-50, these things happened. Um, I, that's no part of my faith, and I don't feel any obligation for people to go that way. I think we have complicated sets of evidence based on tradition, based on trusting people that we love, based on our moral experience, based on our metaphysical views, and all of that gives us some evidence for our faith or for against our faith. And all you're obligated to do as a rational agent is try to follow your complicated, messy evidence where it leads. Um, and so if it leads you to, to be really confident in this, then you're being rational and being really confident in it. Yeah, so um, if you think about it, it's rational to believe things when the preponderance of evidence is in favor of it. It's rational to disbelieve it when the preponderance of evidence is against it. It's rational to be agnostic when the evidence is roughly equal. And so that's the rare case. So I think agnosticism about things should be incredibly rare. So things like, is the number of stars in the universe odd or even? I think we should all be agnostic about that, <laughs> right? But things like uh, whether or not there's a God, I think agnosticism might be a place you pass through on your way from th atheism to theism or from theism to atheism. But to think that you can just maintain that and not find a preponderance of evidence one way or the other seems to me a bizarre place to be. So I think it's a, it's a temporary place, and there are very few things that we should remain agnostic about for long, because we should always be looking for more evidence, and we'd always be finding it one way or the other. Oh. Please give our two debaters a large round of applause.